as, as we all have to spend more time on the screen to check out TED Talks. There's a lot of good ones that aren't even, you know, all just about science. There are lots of other discussions we've been having. I think you'll find, uh, find some relations. So um, with that, I am going to segue into a presentation that I wanted to share with you guys that I did kind of talking about the indigenous people of the United, United States and Canada and the greater, <clears throat> actually all across the world, um, that uh, really tapped into this knowledge and really did identify how important plants were. And you have been reading Braden Sweetgrass, which is, um, which is a great book to kind of get you to think more and more about how really people have been living um, with this knowledge for a long time. And so uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep, okay, good. So thank you for hitting record, Amr. Um, so this is a presentation, this is actually shot from the Evergreen campus. Um, this is the longhouse that when you guys go to campus, you'll see, um, which, which is one of the cool things about Evergreen is that they have actually an ethnobotanical garden around this longhouse and um, gives you some window into what life would have been like, um, of course, with the modern day applique for the people of the Salish Sea. Um, and one of the aspects of their life that is so integral is what, they, what their knowledge of the landscape was and the knowledge of the plants, the knowledge of the seasons, the knowledge of the salmon, uh, the knowledge of the maritime resources, all these things that really were important. Um, and this is a cool map um, that just goes to show you not only looking at um, the United States and Canada, uh, but also looking at uh, Russia and China and Japan at looking at how these uh, basically groups of of tribes lived in the area and uh, the in red here these red lines are actually the uh, salmon run boundaries it's a little hard to see but what I find so amazing about this is that um, you know the more watersheds you have and the more salmon runs you have the more tribes you have as you enter further and further south into where we are in Washington um, and Oregon so this is um, I think it is a, a close-up of that map so you can see this is you know, bef really before the, the what we'll call manifest destiny and the migration westward of Europeans, um, this was largely the makeup of the landscape. And you can see, you know, we have no borders here. We have only uh, very, you know, shapes that are, as you can see, are very much defined by the watersheds. So um, I've always thought that it would be very interesting um, to look at political boundaries in terms of watersheds instead of, as I think many of the tribes um, might have equated their dealings with each other as related more to their watershed than um, trying, trying to uh, put it into something else. So, um, so, you know, indigenous people and still are very um, attuned to this knowledge. And this is a shot actually from um, the local tribe in your area um, whose ground I sit on giving you this presentation of, which is the Squaxin Island tribe. And they, here you can see them, um, they're in a nice dugout canoe. This is a very traditional canoe of the Salish people. Um, what actually I find most beautiful about the canoe is the end of it there, um, or actually the beginning, um, is actually, you'll notice in there, uh, across the tribes, this, this is a similar artistic uh, symbol, but you can see it's actually kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but it's, it looks like a deer head. And that is where, what it's supposed to look like, because the, the idea of the canoe is it's, uh, it's like a deer, right? It's, this, it's humans from land um, moving through the water, which they saw deer doing that. And I just think it's a beautiful uh, homage to another uh, mammal on land that likes to get in the water. So uh, this is a, most likely a, a dugout cedar canoe. Um, cedar is one of the lifebloods and trees and plants of the region. Um, you know, everything from 
canoes to blankets to houses were made with cedar. And that's largely because they, cedar doesn't rot. And that's one of the beautiful things about cedar trees. Um, that is why, you know, if you have cedar shingles on your house, that's why um, lots of good stuff. And it doesn't burn very easy. So all those things combined um, made canoes, them great for canoes. Um, so here's just like a nice uh, picture of a map of all the different tribes just in the Salish Sea. So, um, you know, we often think of our area as the Puget Sound and really, you know, we're familiar with the San Juans, but, you know, when the, let's say, for example, the Kalalum tribe, the tribe up in uh, Port Angeles, they, you know, they lived on Vancouver Island and on, on the peninsula. So, um, you know, this, this idea of borders and boundaries that we live in now, really was not not around as much as it was based on um, you know the community's decision of where that would be not a uh, national system so much more localized control and that's um, why there were so many tribes which I think is uh, speaks to this great concept of sovereignty which uh, is how and something that you know I think a lot of people in our culture would like um, but because of the way we've decided to uh, structure things, it's very hard. And, and for indigenous people, it's been very hard to, to actually keep an idea that they had around um, before the arrival of European uh, colonists. So this is where the concept of sovereignty is something we need to think more and more about in terms of um, what, how we're allowing people to live. And so sovereignty really is you know, the idea of this full right of power to govern yourself, you know, do what you think is best for you. Um, and as we, as we know, we're living in a time a little with a little more um, self-governance and we're seeing some resistance to that. But, uh, you know, it's a very important idea that will continue to be important to be understood as time moves forward um, so that really we can allow people um, to also bring forth this knowledge and the, some of the, let's say, laws of the land that they learned um, can govern their life. So with that, some of the great aspects of the Northwest are the berries we have. So if you guys, you know, live near the forest, uh, it's about to be berry time. And maybe you've already discovered some of this, or if you don't, I'm hoping this lecture will provide you um, a starting point that you can ask me and show me. Um, I can guide you to learn what to eat or not eat, uh, but these are just some examples of berries that uh, indigenous people ate, um, but also, you know, you can eat. And so we have everything from uh, elderberry here, which is in red. Um, they made cakes out of elderberry. People now make wine out of elderberry. Um, the flowers are great smell. You can also make um, other stuff with the flowers. Uh, and then we have salau, which, you know, people collect for uh, displays and bouquets. For the berries, I actually do a lot of painting with. Um, they're, they're delicious. They kind of taste like, you know, a mild grape, um, but they're also a nice deep indigo. So, you know, there's lots of use for these plants. And that's one of the things that indigenous people have also shown us is that, um, you know, there's lots of ways that you can make artwork. Um, and that uh, with the colors, and that's one of the reasons, and because of this vast amount of resources, that's one of the reasons why indigenous people in the Pacific Northwest um, had produced so much artwork, because they had all the resources that they need, and they had time to make great things, which is, um, you know, like in quarantine right now, and uh, going through the pandemic, it's, for me, I've got all the food I need, and I have a little extra time, because I don't have to be anywhere, so I'm making artwork. Um, and that, I think, is an important thing to recognize about um, certain tribes that, um, whereas the Hopi Pueblo down in the south didn't have the berries and the resources that, um, that folks up in the northwest had. So it was, diff they made art too, and, it, and equally beautiful, uh, but just didn't have the chance to do it as much. So, um, oh, you're growing raspberries, nice. Yeah, so raspberries, we actually have... I didn't put it on here, but we have black cap raspberry, which is a native raspberry um, here. If you see like a blue stalk out in the forest and it kind of looks, you know, rad or like that raspberry blackberry -esque, um, find that, I'll point it out to you at the next lecture and we'll identify it. Um, 
So yeah, other berries, service berry here, very unique berry. Um, this leaf has the serrated edge on one side. Only plant I've ever seen has one edge serrated and not one edge not. Um, and service berry was named actually by European settlers um, by the fact that they knew that they could have their services to bury people when the plant started to flower because they knew that the ground had uh, thought. <laughs> so I think that's, it, once again, we talk about the origins of names and words, and um, there's an interesting one. Uh, salmon berry up here in the corner. It's a delicious one, makes great pies, very seedy. And uh, that's one that I, I think you'll probably find out and about right now. Um, so let's see. Elizabeth had a question or a comment. I found a berry on my walk that looked like a blackberry and was turning red to black, but the berries were soft and little round parts were small and black. Uh, you know, that might have been a trailing blackberry. Those do that as well. Um, and they're kind of like, they have three leaves. They generally just crawl across the ground, don't grow very high. Uh, but they generally go from red to black. And another interesting piece of technology and science, that berry that I think you're talking about was actually um, the, the origin of all colored inks on your printer came from uh, a synthesis of trailing blackberry. I, I used to know uh, my, well, my friend's dad worked for Xerox um, down in Oregon and uh, told me that yeah, that was one of their big breakthroughs and why they put themselves in the Northwest because they wanted to do more research on uh, why is it that, for example, trailing blackberry, extremely dark and powerful color and it dries instantly. So that stain quality is something that, uh, that you know, once again, we have to keep these plants around to know what technology we can derive from them as um, we heard in the TED talk, maybe making cars out of, uh, out of something that regenerates itself. So last one down in the corner here is thimbleberry. Um, beautiful red berry, probably my favorite berry. It's very uh, sweet and I like to cover them in chocolate. Um, that's, that's also what some of my uh, forest friends have called nature's toilet paper because the leaves are very soft. So if you find a very soft leaf out in the forest and you're in a pinch, uh, there's another use. So. Uh, so other things that were uh, integral to life here in the Northwest uh, were materials. So, you know, food's one thing, but as I discussed with the canoes, um, cedar, there's this picture of the cedar tree there. Um, you know, they would use for the bark example, they, cedar is an amazing regenerative, has an amazing regenerative quality because you can strip the bark off and actually it will grow back over itself and not hurt the tree. So that's how they would actually collect cedar strips without harming the tree um, and continually being able to go back to those trees. And if you're walking around, you know, some areas, um, I'm sure in, in Shelton have um, probably members of the Squaxin still collecting these materials. So um, very cool. This actually in um, the first picture is one I wanted to uh, point out for our leaf collection, but also um, say that it gets somewhat of a bad name because it's actually not as uh, dangerous as something like poison oak, which um, I'll show you later. I didn't have it up here because they didn't really use it because it's very, um, it's not good. For, <laughs> it's much worse than sting nettle. So sting nettle, uh, Urtica dialica, the scientific name, is uh, a plant that is very interesting because it will sting you. It's not going to last forever. Um, the sting or like poison oak, it won't burn you. Um, but it will be very annoying, like a mosquito bite or something, uh, but with a little sharper pain. Um, but actually, the stingers are only on one side of the leaf. So indigenous people and people today even, uh, if you pick it from the underside, you can actually close it, close it together and crush the leaf together, you can actually remove all of its stinging qualities because the mechanism on that plant that actually uh, stings you is actually like a hypodermic needle made of uh, silica, which is the same thing as glass, um, and it actually will break very easily if you crush it. So um, you can cook it, cook it down, you can make great tea with it. So it's kind of one of those plants that's somewhat dangerous, but that's why it's probably developed that evolutionary mechanism to ensure that not everybody eats it, because it is has so many great qualities. Um, and it's in the mint family. It's a, and we'll talk more about plant families and uh, 
and I'm going to do a little cap of what students um, who missed last week uh, what we talked about because we'll get we'll get more back into that in a little bit. Um, so this and then this picture here is sweetgrass actually. So this is actually a picture of sweetgrass being uh, collected. And you know, sweetgrass is one of those plants that is actually not around as much anymore. It used to be much more prevalent, um, and its its environment, its habitat turned uh, was pasteurized a lot, so it turned to cattle. Um, so that's you know one of the plants we really want to bring back because as you read bring sweetgrass, you'll learn more and more about the role of sweetgrass and how uh, how beautiful of a plant it is. So, and then another one um, that you've probably seen around, not to be confused with uh, thimbleberry, is, is uh, Devil's Club. So this guy here is got very uh, sharp needles on it. Doesn't have anything necessarily, you know, like seeing now, doesn't have any toxin in the thorns, but um, it is not one you want to bump up against. And it's actually, its thorns are so sharp that tribes like the macaw actually used it in making uh, fish hooks. So that's just a classic example of where materials uh, make, can make or break your uh, hunting or collection. So with hunting and, and collecting other things, um, I wanted to share with you all a piece of artwork that uh, if you were in the financial literacy meeting I shared with um, the uh, Shannon, right? Or Sh Sharon, I can't remember. Um, so she, you know, I shared with this with her because this is more of what I want to do um, is make artwork like this that communicates uh, this concept of the ecosystem. And these are all the salmonid species uh, that live in the Pacific Northwest here, um, including, you know, a male and a female Chinook, which are the biggest. We've got a steelhead and then also a chum, which in our area, there is a lot of chum, chum around. And that was one of the um, the key fish to uh, basically most of most of people and then spawning higher up in the watershed are coho so um, there's a mating pair and they get the highest up in the watershed so this painting was meant to kind of show where each species uh, colonizes and you know spawns but also the ocean that where the freshwater and the saltwater mixes the estuary the main stem of the river and then um, and then higher up. So that's just an example of how, you know, and as those fish fill the watershed, people could have, you know, different species in different places. So that's important uh, for indigenous people too. So now we're gonna move quickly into, and I gotta keep an eye on time here, all right. Um, now we're gonna move into uh, just a quick overview of something very complex, which is US Ind Indian policy um, or what was basically the genocide of, uh, of Native American tribes in the Northwest and all through the country. Um, so, you know, really the Louisiana Purchase set it all off. And, you know, that was in basically when the U.S. bought um, the land that we sit on, bought from the French. And so that's when westward expansion really took place. And, you know, there was treaty making before that, but really, the treaties were really a, uh, a marshalling of, of legitimacy to do what the U.S. thought they needed to do on their investment, which was the Louisiana Purchase. So this, you know, this behavior of doing something that maybe you know was wrong, well, I can't even claim that they knew it was wrong, um, but, you know, return, needing to get the return on that investment is something we see today of, the ends justifying the means. So I think that that's important um, to look at even, you know, 200 plus years ago, um, how that behavior was rewarded. So, you know, really, and then 19, um, and then we started to get into the Indian, Re Indian Removal Act. Um, and let's see, yeah, so the Indian Removal Act in 1830 was then uh, signed by President Andrew Jackson, who um, we unfortunately, heard some people praising, um, and I won't mention who, but those who know, know, and uh, yeah, it's, it's quite sad that, um, that Andrew Jackson is getting any, any lip service, because he was the one who basically said, well, we're going to remove 
Native American tribes from the south, and we're going to move west, and we're going to push um, everybody out of their ancestral lands. And yeah, it's been you know understood now, looking in hindsight, unfortunately, um, or maybe not. I'm not sure that it was genocide because it discriminated against a, a group of people, and that's really what we, you know, a classic example of history that we need to look at and really examine. So, um, and then, you know, these acts, like the reason I bring up these acts is because these were things that shaped what we see today. So, you know, here's Andrew Jackson today, right? <laughs> and uh, I've in a very timely photo and look at where he is. He's right out in front of the White House. So um, these are pretty important things that are very, much around us, but you know, if we never had this lecture or had the time to um, to look deeper into it, then maybe we wouldn't know that Andrew Jackson wasn't such a great guy at all. And uh, I just like this uh, this picture. So, especially with with a, that gentleman <laughs> lassoing his foot. So, um, so then we move into the context home. clue too, right? Of who may have said something positive about Andrew yeah. recently. <laughs> You got it. Yes. And so, yeah, so now we move into, so I show these acts, right? Because in our history, the the government uses acts as what, you know, the CARES Act, like things that we've heard about now. So these are things that have been around a lot, but they often legitimize whatever's going to happen, right? So the Homestead Act, this is on actually postage, which was when stamps were only four cents. It is a very classic early homestead mound um, hut that people used to live in when they moved out into the prairie where there were no um uh where there were no you know trees to harp you know harvest to make a home so um that was just one of the one of the examples of how you know look at this we we're now pushing in addition to uh pushing people out now we're actually giving people lands which is what the homestead act was about um to move west and then as people got further west we got into the Dawes Act and so you know this is where uh, this was literally what was posted about you know Indian land for sale so like think about that in general you know get a home <laughs> of your own easy payments so now we're instead of giving it away now we're actually selling it for you know pennies on the dollar for what it's worth so um, and then this is a map that uh, you know, for if we're, because really what happened was we were forcing indigenous people to assimilate to our culture and, and say like, okay, we're going to impose the English tax structure on you now and make your land, lands worth money as opposed to worth the plants and the animals that um, you knew were of value there. So anyway, this is just a good breakdown of, um, of how much it depleted, how and how quickly, right? You know, by 18 to 1880, really only Arizona and New Mexico, and um, this was where the reservations were set up, and that was part of the Dawes Act too. Was giving people what you see in 1880, these little postage stamps that were left. So, um, okay, yeah. Um, okay. Question from the chat. We're uh, okay. supplementary information okay just making sure I'm keeping pace here all right so yeah and now we move to Washington back to Washington Washington actually got spared a little bit in the uh, allotment of reservation lands and that was <laughs> only because they had a good lawyer um, so they had um, basically there was um, there was a, a uh, Someone who worked in the government. Um, gosh, why am I spacing on his name? Uh, the, the, <laughs> it'll come to me. Um, yeah, there was a <laughs> there was a good a good American who went through and basically told the um, told uh, the tribes of Washington that this was coming, and you know you need to make sure that you you know when they come. When they come to you for something to sign that you really maintain a reservation and the actual uh sovereignty of, of those lands so in oregon where i'm from there are far less reservations because um gosh i don't know why i'm spacing on his name because i <laughs> um Mc, it's not yeah um not whitman no no anyway it'll come to me at the end here um 
basically uh, this guy went through and made sure that everybody knew what was coming and he helped set up Washington's reservation system. So you can see here, number 20 is the Squaxins. Um, oh, sorry, number tw 23, number 20 is the Skohomish. And then, uh, you know, down here we've got um, the, like number one is the Chehalis, um, number 11 is the Nisqually. Uh, so, you know, all these different tribes that, you know, were able to maintain themselves because they had a piece of land where, um, where the other, you know, other tribes like you go down to California and it's not, definitely not the same because um, they never had anybody there to, to show them um, the way that they need to move, move through this process in order to keep something. So the Squaxin Island people are our, our people here in, in the area. Uh, they're the people of the water, and basically, you know, from Olympia to Shelton um, was really their big part of their domain. And what's really cool is actually that Squaxin Island is uh, really a window into the past because it doesn't have any development on it. And actually, a member of my cohort um, in the Master Environmental Studies program, her boyfriend actually is a member of the tribe, and he uh, he actually is the one who guards the island and makes sure that nobody comes to you know, mess it up or uh, res extract the resources. But I think that's important to mention that, you know, the Squaxin are maintaining and really protecting um, a window into our ecological past. So this is some some of the practices that the Squaxin do. This is a fish, uh, you know, smoking fish uh, over a, with their classic um, with weirs. And then uh, this is some of their traditional dress uh, made with cedar and other uh, carex, you know, that we'll talk about later. So lots of different um, different tribes in our area. I don't think we have time today, but I can get into next time the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe. I've got a nice Prezi here um, that you can follow too that I'll put up on Canvas if you want to um, look at that more. But, you know, there's a lot of really important um, tribes in our area that uh, we're going to talk about more as we read Green Sweetgrass and uh, just really look at why, you know, why the landscape looks like it does. So here's an example of where the reservation systems are left. Uh, and back to what I was saying, you know, here's Umatilla, the Warm Springs, those are really in Oregon, the only two um, that, that were set up that were actually remain. So uh, that's, you know, and these other little postage stamps are really, you know, like they all want to try, they're really more like towns and um, not much less like the actual land that is there. So um, very interesting. And then just one last from uh, as a plug for my home state. Uh, you know, here's a here's a layout of the tribes of Oregon. And what I find so interesting about this back to what I was talking about with watersheds is um, and having worked in some of the watersheds, they the the size of these tribes is really related to uh, how many rivers there are. So the small if they're like the slets, there's a lot of rivers and there's a lot of fish. Tillamook is actually bigger rivers, so not as many. So I find it very interesting that this kind of uh, self-determination also resources was, uh, to me, seems like a very uh, ethical way to live. So um, so with that, I think I'm even a little bit over. Um, we do have some brains. What's that? It's okay. Okay. Um, so we do have some braiding sweetgrass to talk about. Um, from our discussions. So, you know, if maybe we want to go around, I don't think we have time today to do a full seminar, but maybe if we want to talk a little bit about some something you got out of the text that relates to um, relates to what we're talking about today, uh, that would be that would be great because I'm I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on the first first two sections. So let's just uh, go around one by one. I can call on you or um, yeah, or you can speak up. It's up to you. But I'm, but everybody's gonna talk <laughs> real quick. So, who wants to go first? Xavier, <laughs> I see you sleep. Only because your screen's on, I can see you off the screen. That's like. <laughs> Could you give me like, uh, could I be the next person? Just give me sure. a moment. Sure, no problem. 
Uh, how about? Call it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I was gonna say let's let's pick on somebody who doesn't have their screen on. Yeah, Jay, what do you think? What have you what have you in your thoughts based on the readings and? Um, yeah, what are your reflections? We want to know. Um, honestly, I've just I didn't know how much there was of the, like you, no one really shows you this. No mm. one really goes into details about how many different tribes and all the places and every section. It's a lot different, and it's very interesting to see. That's great. That really, you just made my day. <laughs> yeah, it's and and like we've said, you know, it's a it's a tough part of history, right? So it's just that's and well, that's why we're sharing it with you, and we want you to know because because um, I'm only glancing the surface. There's so much, and I've um, included some links in this pre presentation for you to follow um, if you want to learn more because there's there's a lot I don't know even so. Yeah, there's a lot of different stuff. Great. All right, how about Allie? Um, I mean, I agree with her. Like, this is stuff that we didn't really know, and they don't even teach it to us in, like, history class that much. Yeah. But yeah. it's really cool. Well, that's great. And yeah, any any thoughts on, you know, how, how about the reading? What is that? That has that shared any new insights that you haven't learned in school? Um, well, I learned about the like eutrophic and oligotrophic ponds and stuff like that. Very cool. Excellent. Okay, well, let's keep moving here. Uh, how about Christina and Angie? Okay, hi. Um, uh, there's be talking in the background, but um, um, I like how like in the story they give like they give like stories about like why the why nature does that, like in um, oh what's it called maple moon moon maple sugar? I can't. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah right. I like like I when I was reading it, it was like um. The people got lazy, and then um, the man who was there was like, "You guys are like lazy, so now I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna like make the maple go slow, and so that's why like it takes 40 gallons to make one gallon of maple." And I just thought that was like, "Oh wow!" Like they have like amazing and like uh, very. Um, interesting stories and like I like those like I like reading about that because it kind of has a it has a purpose and so it's like you know it's like um it's like you know if this happens if you don't take care of this then this will happen so stuff like that was like very um interesting like consequences for your actions yeah like con yeah consequences for your actions. um and then for me um and this can be about anything right about anything of the readings mm -hmm. so yeah, like I, haven't heard, I really haven't heard a lot about braiding sweetgrass and like um when i was reading that i'm like a quarter way through um the beginning really resonated with what um like with what i haven't heard like i always hear about um adam and eve and the way she was talking about how um the woman came down and like how they um separated uh or they like at the beginning it contrasted between how like christianity was like saying like it was a consequence to be on earth but then on the other side the woman was like making earth um for us to live on and for us to like thrive and grow i just it i don't know it's just been on my mind and I've been just thinking about it and like comparing different things of what I've learned. And I actually talked to someone um, at work about it because it just resonated with me so much and I just needed to talk um, something about it. And he's Jehovah's Witness and I'm um, Roman Catholic. So it's, it's just 
like so like I don't know. It was just something. It was a good I, like conversation to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. That's exactly what the text is supposed to, you know, generate is some good conversations about um yeah, why things look the way they look. And you know, there's always uh many ways to do that. And I like that you like the story. Um I am going to share just a quick story about a, a plant that I think does a lot to what you're talking about, that sugar moon, or sugar, uh, maple sugar moon, that, that chapter, uh, which I think is, yeah, these moral and ethical messages through uh, the way things are, I think is great. So hemlock uh, was a tree that you'll find in the Northwest, um, and Western hemlock is what we know it as, but hemlock, when he went to go get his uh, cones and sized up by the creator, you know, be created, he went, had to stand in line. And instead of standing in line, Hemlock ran to the front of the line and said, oh, creator, I want to have the most, I want to be the tallest. I want the biggest cones. I, you know, I am, I'm obviously the best tree. So just give it to me, would you? And so the creator said to Hemlock, well, Hemlock, you know, you didn't really wait your turn in line here with the rest of the trees. And, you know, you're not, necessarily the best tree because we're all the best tree uh so maybe i should actually give you the smallest cones and instead of letting you grow to the great heights of let's say the seco great giant sequoias that we saw in uh in the video earlier i'm gonna actually give you the smallest cones and you're gonna have to grow under all the other trees and actually, you're going to bow to the other trees as you grow, um, and which is all true, as you see hemlocks today when they're growing in the forest. Their tops lean over a little bit. They grow in the shade. They have the smallest cones. So there's another great story that I think uh, relates to what you're talking about, about how do you look at something and understand why it maybe came to be, and maybe there's a human element to it. So that's great. I really appreciate you sharing all those thoughts and ideas. Okay, um, how, let's move uh, to Veronica. Um, hi. Hey. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the Council of Pecans because mm -hmm. that one really was interesting to me and it was like one of those chapters where I didn't like stop or had to take a break or anything. That's awesome. That was cool. <laughs> um, I just thought it was interesting how she started off with like a story about two little boys we were just hungry and was looking for food, you know? And then later she goes to say that it was her grandpa and stuff. So I thought that was really cool. And then she talks about how they couldn't really find any good source of food until they came across like the pecan grove, you know? And mm -hmm. so they took off their pants and stuff and they like stuffed them with pecans and stuff. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I just like how the, that pecan tree kind of moves through the generations, you know? It was in his life, and now it's in her life. So that was really cool. That is very cool. I, I think that's a great, great message. Um, how about Quinn? Or Xavier, whoever's ready. Sure, I can go. Um, so I read the, what was it called? What is, uh, I read, oh, Allegiance to Gratitude. And it like had this different perspective on the American thing, uh, like the Pledge of Allegiance and the Thanksgiving Address. And so just like from part one, where I read an offering, they both had different, um, perspectives on like how things would go like for an offering they thought oh I've been disconnected from the tribe for so long like we're not fully uh tribal yet we, we still have like coffee makers and stuff but then they learn that they're truly like part of the I'm bad at explaining part of the uh native thing yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. And then for uh, the allegiance one, it's just that they 
they have mixed feelings on it. They don't really care for the um, Thanksgiving address. They don't care for the Pledge of Allegiance that they're forced to do. And it's just, it's a different perspective from me because I'm, I'm not like open to all this stuff. I, I don't really see this. So this is really cool. That's it. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, how, Quinn, did, are you ready? I guess sort of, but like, I don't know. I don't have a lot of like, I don't have like a ton of thoughts on it, but I think it's an interesting perspective that the book definitely gives on this sort of world where nature is so important and like this this different culture that I haven't really been able to observe before. And it's definitely something that's very different to like the everyday life that we, you know, go through. And there's all these different, like I never really thought about the Pledge of Allegiance and I never really thought about like nature and the way that they mention it so much. I think it's just one of those things that like, you know, think about it until it's like put right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And and yet it is right in front of us, you know? So that's, um, yeah, that's exactly what, you guys are getting everything out of the text that I'm, I'm hoping for. So that's fantastic. Uh, Courtney, what did you get out of it? Um, I just thought it was like a different perspective something that I didn't see before. And oh, and what uh, what what chapters did did you enjoy? I've only read one chapter so far. Okay, that's fine. Well, next time let's um, next time we do this. Uh, I want I, as some of you did in your response it'd be great just to have, you know, like a quote or something that you uh, can respond to. And that's one of the reasons we do responses. So we, when we're having a seminar, we can say like, oh yeah, I like this quote, you know, or this, this, this is the text I want to say that described, you know, uh, what you're trying to communicate. So um, that's great, Courtney. Thank you for sharing. Um, how about Carolina or Carlina? Sorry. Arena, arena, arena. Sorry, on my speaker thing is in the way. My bad. Apologies. It's okay. Um, I read. Um, I kind of really like learning the grammar of animacy. I think that's how you say it. Um, but I really like the first paragraph where it was talking about him, like, you know, going to listen. Uh, things kind of like connecting with nature. Um, when he said, uh. I hear the voices, oh, hold on, that's the wrong one. Oh, I come here to listen and nestle in the curve of the roots in a soft hollow of pine needles to lean my bones against a column of white pine. And it kind of like, you know, it, it was like, you know, I just really liked it. Yeah, that's, it's, uh, that's why this book is so great is that it does just really say things that are, yeah, he, uh, pleasing to the world, as I think. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's exactly, you did a great job of, of what we'll do you know, more in a seminar, with pulling out sections that, you know, if you were going to write something, you want to, you know, really use that. Um, so that's great. You're exactly what we want you to do. Um, okay, who have I missed? I can't, I don't know if I'm on one page. Um, Anybody, anybody who hasn't gone, I think that's everyone. Um, so that gives us, that good, um, that gives you 10 minutes left, so. Yeah, <laughs> so here's how I'm gonna reef an angle uh, to, to make this work and to not uh, keep you all for like an extra half hour as I've been doing. I do feel bad about how often we've been going over time. Um, we definitely don't have time to do the activity I had in mind in 10 minutes. Um, and so I would like to, I think, Graham, you and I are just going to have to get into the habit of like passing the baton class session to class session in terms of the way things are playing out. Um, yeah. So I think I can do the activity and talk about uh, the chapter eight reading um, with you all on Monday. Um, I may even, 
I want you to draft your your essay over the weekend. So read that stuff uh, tonight if you haven't yet. Um, just like so you have it under the belt as you're drafting, um, and we'll take it up at length on Monday, and I'll sort of uh, get a sense of how far everybody has gotten on the draft at that point as well. So what I'd like to do with the time we have left, at least though, is um, to go ahead and uh, have you vote on an example for me to read aloud to you. I uploaded 10 different uh, student essays from previous classes of mine um, in response to uh, different iterations of this prompt, let's say. Not the exact same prompt you have, right? I've had larger page requirement, uh, required incorporating some sources, and uh, have also had variations where it was like, open to racism and sexism or other isms, not just racism. Um, but I, I chose examples that are focused just on racism. You'll just see sometimes they're, they're bringing in scholarly sources, right? Or some of them get to be quite a lot longer than three pages. Um, and so you don't have to feel as though, oh, I have to write six pages because this example is six pages. Um, but I think that all of these have their, their use values. So I'm gonna, share the screen real quick and kind of give you a snapshot of what, what each of these is um, and then have you choose which one will, which one I'll read aloud to you today. Um, and I need you to choose at least two more to read for tonight. Um, so the very first one is from last quarter. It was an older gentleman. Um, I think he was about 31 or so. And so that's a little bit of a different perspective you get. Um, and he talks a lot about like what he didn't learn in history classes and stuff, which, I, which for me made it a pretty uh, powerful and impactful essay. Um, refresh my memory real quick. This one was about somebody's experience uh, with her adopted sister um, and her mom was indigenous, uh, the sister's mom was indigenous. Um, and so it's about uh, a lot of the stereotypes she had in mind as a young girl when uh, her sister is first meeting her mom, uh, particularly associating um, Native communities with alcoholism. Um, that's kind of a heavy one. This one is about a time that uh, one of her friends, boyfriends, made an extremely racist joke and how she didn't say anything and why she didn't say anything, reflecting from there. This one is uh, somebody who was assaulted by a Latinx uh, peer and for years afterwards held extremely racist views towards Latinx communities thinking they were all um, sexual predators, much like we heard, you know, I, I'm not shy to say it, like I hate Trump, I'll say it. Right, much like we heard the president say about all Mexicans being rapists. Um, more context clues for you. <laughs> this is a, a young woman about your age, actually, a little bit older, but not by much, um, reflecting on a number of years that she associated whiteness and particularly extremely pale, right? Like goth whiteness um, with beauty and why that was problematic. So it's actually a pretty powerful little essay. See, Xavier looks a little confused. You have, you wanna, you have, can I clarify it for you? No, or you're just kind of cringing? <laughs> yeah, um, but of course we all have things we look back honestly that we can cringe on. And so I liked it because it was vulnerable. That's the type of reflection I most like to see. Um, this is 
from a young man who grew up in Tenino and was very much stumped by this prompt because he didn't have any interactions with people who weren't white and therefore felt like he had never experienced or even seen racism. And so I thought it'd be a good example just because it's like, well, here's what you can, you know, here's how you can still do a good reflection, even if that's your situation. Um, this one is, I think she was, uh, yep, Vietnamese American. Um, and some of the self internalized stereotypes that she carried with her. I think I missed one somewhere here. It might be example five, but there's one on here that was about the student's perception of me before he met me based on my name, which is kind of hilarious. Like, I definitely laughed out loud several times when I read it. Because, um, of course, you know. He imagined I would wear a turban and that maybe I'd have a thick accent and stuff like that. Um, sorry, my internet's acting a little slow. Give it a moment here. There it goes. Okay, Filipino American. Um, a similar type of thing where she really allowed like some of the stereotypes that were being levied at her to impact her in a negative way um, and even began internalizing those stereotypes. And then last one here. Ah, this was a real gem as well. So this was um, a young black student, I think he was like 16 or so, running start student, um, who was homeschooled and had most of his friends uh, via video games and Discord, right? Um, and ended up playing the role of moderator on an extremely racist forum. Um, and so he was like, po ended up for, peer pressure reasons, right? Posting, you know, memes with the N word and stuff like this. And then he got exposed as black and got doxxed and his whole family uh, felt in danger for a moment. And so that, that was a pretty crazy one. It was called, where to even start? Um, and I think this is the one that was, Yes, this is the one that was specifically about stereotyping me. Okay, so should we go with example number one with the older gentleman? Raise your hand if that's of interest. No, no one wants to read the older gentleman, okay. I recommend that one, actually. It's one of the best essays I've ever gotten on this prompt. <laughs> I maybe didn't explain it well enough, but in the ways that he talks about the history he learned versus what he got exposed to later. Uh, who's interested in the story about her sister, uh, her ha or sorry, her native sister and the experience visiting the reservation? Raise your hand. One person. You can use the emoji thing too. Thumbs up. Okay, so one person's interested in that one. What about the one uh, where her friend's boyfriend made the racist joke? Who's interested in that one? Okay. How about the one where I got stereotyped before the kid, the guy met me? No. How about the young woman who uh, was reflecting on why she thought especially pale whiteness was beautiful for so many years? Who's interested in that one? Ali? One person? <laughs> Um, 
We've got something in the chat. Oh, two people. Do the tonight one. Who wants to, to hear from the young gentleman who felt stumped? So Xavier, one, two people. Okay, so we got so far a tie between that one and my beautiful white lily. Bad Asian versus model minority. The Vietnamese American student who's interested in that one. One, Elizabeth is one person. <laughs> oh, two, okay. So far we got a three-way tie then. The other one from the Filipino American. This one has some particularly gruesome stuff about people's reactions to like the lunches she was bringing. One. Uh, wait, um, okay, so um, my brother used to be uh, married to a Filipino woman. Um, not, excuse the, the, the background. It's okay. But, um, uh, um, so like she was about what she ate um, in the Philippines and like what, she, and then like um, since there was like no Asian market here in Shelton, she would like, um, she and him would drive to like um, Tacoma and Seattle just to find the food. And then she would like show us um, what it was called or, and I think Balu is um, the egg. Mm -hmm. you know, with the, yeah, the life, the, the baby egg duck thing, you know, and they would just peel it and eat it. And it was fine. I mean, my brother liked it and I didn't, I thought I uh, I didn't try it because I thought it was like you know a little gross because it's not my culture. Not it's not gross, but it's not from my culture. But I did you know thought it was cool and stuff like that. So that's why I'm kind of interested. Okay. Um, I'm trying to create a poll right now, but it is not cooperating. Um, and now. What is going on? What are you doing? Why? <laughs> okay. Um, bu -bu -bu. So then we've got finally ah, uh, where to even start the uh, the young black student who ended up as a forum moderator who's interested in that one. I can't get the poll to work right now. Like my internet's acting funky. No one's interested in that one? Okay. So then that leaves us with my beautiful white lily. Oops, this is the wrong one. That was, sorry. Angie wants to change her vote. Okay, what do you want to change your vote to, Angie? The Filipino American. Okay. No? Okay, Filipino. Oops. Um, so then that would mean that it's really between do, 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 the Tenaino one and the Filipino one. Yes? Explain what the Tenaino one, one was again. So that one was, he felt like he didn't have any experiences to reflect on because he didn't have any one he knew in, his, in the school he went to who was not white, right? And so he was like, well, I haven't seen racism because there's nobody to be racist against. There's nobody for my peers to be racist against. Um, and so he really struggled with the prompt but ended up like getting there in terms of like the lack of exposure angle and then he wasn't white or was he, he was white right but he he felt stumped because he was like well i've seen you know you know people uh, behave in problematic ways but i'm the one railing against it and the iteration of the prompt i should say was i was 
in that quarter, forcing them to think about times they had been unintentionally racist. And so the way that he finally got there was to think about like what he didn't know. So one more, one more show of hands. Do we want to do the bystander effect uh, one on Filipino American experience, or do we want to do the Tenino experience one? Oh, Veronica has jumped in. Filipino, Filipino, Tenino. Looks like we're landing on Filipino overall in terms of um, the most uh, folks who've actually chimed in. Oh, another one in the chat. Oh, another for Tenino. Yep, yep that's still what I thought. It still reflects who I saw raise their hand. Um, so if you are interested in the Tenino one, though, just choose it as one of your two. You're also totally free to read more than two. Um, but I'm just looking for a very simple response on this in terms of what did you learn that was new or what insight did this give you in terms of how to respond to the prompt. So I'll read this real quick and then I'll let you go for today. Just put the reminder that you've got two reading assignments, chapter eight of uh, Alan Johnson and uh, to select two of these essays and respond to the prompt I have up here, which again is just what stood out to you? What did you learn from reading other people's reflections? All right, the bystander effect and stereotypical jokes. I'm an Asian American, Filipino American to be more specific. If you were to look at me as a person, you could say that I follow a lot of Asian slash Filipino stereotypes. I play an instrument. I have good grades. Most of my meals include rice. I prefer Jollibee over any other fast food restaurant and I'm generally quiet. While I do follow these stereotypes unintentionally, that doesn't mean that my existence is a stereotype. And yet, people always felt to comment on my heritage the moment they find out about my nationality. I was always asked if I followed this stereotype and that stereotype, actually, can you sing? Filipinos speak Spanish, right? Do you eat dogs? I remember bringing Filipino food to elementary school. I suppose it's worth mentioning that the vast majority of that school was white and Christian and getting dirty looks. My classmates felt the need to make comments about my lunch. Ew, it smells. Why does your food look so gross? It's disgusting. Your food is so weird. You eat that? Well, these comments weren't exactly the worst. They still instilled insecurity into me. Why was I so different from my classmates? Did it really matter what my nationality was? The comments didn't just stop at my meals. I heard them everywhere. It was inescapable. It all felt normal to me at the time. When people made racist jokes, it felt like a stab. According to Psychology Today, jokes where a minority is at the expense can affect how a person perceives that minority. Those who grew up in an environment that tolerates racism, sexism, etc., can have their views solidified by these seemingly, quote, harmless jokes. Thomas Ford, one of the psychologists of Western Carolina University, explains this concept. People who are sexist to begin with and enjoy sexist jokes show higher tolerance for sexist events, tend to accept rape myths, and tend to show greater willingness to discriminate against women. When my classmates made jokes about my nationality, they affected me more than they realized. However, because no one was ever told that it was not okay to do so, my classmates continued thinking that it was all in good fun. I became ashamed of my heritage for a long time and dreaded people finding out about me being half Filipino. I remember quietly praying every night that I would become normal, quote unquote, someday. I believed that if I became normal, then I would not have to deal with being joked about. Cut forward a few years to middle school. I was beginning to explore and discover my identity and more about myself. I was vulnerable, yet believed that I, a middle schooler, knew everything. By then, the comments about my race didn't affect me nearly as much. And I thought that I was over it, quote unquote. But little did I know, I 100% internalized it and still felt insecurity about my heritage. Never really acknowledged it. It was just there. I felt indifferent about my heritage. Never felt any need to get to know my Filipino side better. I was like one of the, quote, normal kids. Why would I ever need to mention it? I went along my business as usual until one day there was a new student in school. I still went to a small school, about 200 kids, so it was tiny. So everyone knew everyone. So when the news spread that there was a new kid, I knew about the kid pretty quickly, I'd be calling this kid D for privacy's sake. He was half Filipino, like me. 
It caught my attention. Despite any, indif any indifference about my nationality, I still felt a bit of curiosity and desire to meet him. The bell rang, and I decided that I would sit next to him during lunch and introduce myself. As I walked into the cafeteria, there was a slight anxious feeling in my stomach. Naturally, meeting someone new made me nervous. As I walked further into the cafeteria and the lunch line, I scanned the room for a particular unfamiliar face. By the time I finally got my lunch, I saw D. I took a deep breath and walked up to the table. There were a couple kids sitting at the table, but they were minding their own business and didn't seem to have any plans to talk to D. I mustered a small smile to D. Our first meeting wasn't too eventful. It was just what you would think of. Hello, my name is, etc. We ended up talking about Pokemon. The next day, D and I sat together again and had more conversations about Pokemon. That was when D pulled out his lunch. I don't remember exactly what the lunch was, but it was very obviously not American or, quote, normal. Somehow that managed to catch the attention of one of the nearby kids. What even is that? It looks like shit. Then came the sea of unnecessary and rude comments. Very soon, it escalated to comments about his dark, tan skin. I could see it on Dee's face. He looked uncomfortable and scared. I could see myself in him, having gone through the same thing. I should have said something, anything really, to try to defend him. But I didn't. I was scared that I would be targeted as well. I was a bystander and was just as bad as the bullies. While I never said anything racist in that moment, my actions spoke louder than my words. By doing absolutely nothing in that situation, I was allowing the comments to be spoken. That intention, I'd given out the message that comments like that were okay and acceptable. More often than not, bystanders tend to witness the microaggression side of racism. An example of racist microaggression is asking a person of color where they really are from, implying that all people of color are foreigners. Daryl Wing Su, a professor of counseling and psychology at Columbia University, describes micro racist microaggression as different from everyday rudeness in the following ways. They are A, constant and continue on the lives of people of color. B, cumulative in nature and represent a lifelong burden of stress. C, continuous reminders of the target group's second-class status in society. And D, symbolic of past governmental injustices directed toward people of color. However, Bystanders can still do something to combat the racism that so remains rampant in our everyday lives. The authors of Bystander Anti-Racism, Review of the Literature, Dr. Jacqueline K. Nelson, who primarily researches how racism manifests in today's world, and Kevin M. Dune, a professor of urban studies, use the term bystander anti-racism. They define it as action taken by a person or persons not directly involved as a target or perpetrator to speak out about or to seek to engage others in responding, either directly or indirectly, immediately or at a later time, against interpersonal or systemic racism. When a bystander interferes, they can help de-escalate the situation as well as help the instigator to realize how their actions are affecting others. Bystanders should avoid acting passively when facing a situation involving racism. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. As stated by Nelson and Dune, bystanders are more likely to help those who are more like them than those who are different. An example given by the article includes, includes the fact that white Americans are more likely to offer help to other white Americans than black Americans, even if the help needed had nothing to do with race. In addition, bystanders tended to avoid stepping in because of their own personal risk. Bystanders would fear if they stepped in, they would be targeted as well. Not only that, but it may affect their relationships with the bully if they had some sort of relationship in the first place. Yet if you were to ask a bystander why they did not interfere, the most common answer was, it was none of my business to interfere. Take note of how the above reasons listed, neglecting to intervene involved the bystander primarily. Not only were the majority of the reasons bystanders use self-focused, but they also involved societal norms, e.g. white Americans more likely to help other white, white Americans than black Americans. Despite all that, several bystanders like to act like they are innocent. Just because they never said anything racist, sexist, etc., then they must mean then that must mean that they didn't do anything wrong. When faced with someone experiencing discrimination, bystanders tend to not interfere because of how groomed they usually are, especially if the bystander is part of the majority, white, male, able-bodied, straight, cisgender, etc. They tend to not notice how discriminatory how discriminatory a comment may be. 
even with my own experience with being the target of racist remarks and stereotypes, I still allowed racism to happen. I was a bystander and made no attempt to defend my classmate when people insulted him based on his skin color. I regret it to this day, but with my knowledge now, I know that it is still too easy to let racism and racist remarks slide without any second thought. Even with my fear of being targeted, I should have stood up for D, because by not standing up for him, I sent the message that I was okay with the racist comments. No one is immune to the bystander effect, regardless of whether or not they have been a target of racism themselves. The bystander effect is very much real. It has a great impact on how much, or sorry, a great impact on how racism runs in today's society. All right, y'all. So as I said, take up uh, two more uh, of your choosing minimum. You can always choose more. And we'll focus on talking about this stuff uh, in more depth next class session. And maybe we can have a little bit of time as well where we share some of what we've been able to generate over the weekend in terms of uh, drafting the first draft of this essay. So any questions before I close the room out today? Oh, and I was just going to say, we were going to do a, a scientific illustration exercise, but uh, just know I've changed dates on Canvas, so uh, we'll get to we'll get to all that, and yeah, not to worry. Thank you guys. You did great today. I just want to say quickly to you guys, does anyone want help brainstorming or getting started on their personal statement? I can be available this afternoon on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, <laughs> Quinn. <laughs> Oops. Uh, but I can be available for one on one or small groups during your independent learning time or anything else. So, anyone, you can speak now or you can message me. I'm going to remind you know how to get a hold of me. But if anyone would like time, I have time before three o'clock today to help you get started on your personal statement. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I can do the same too if you guys want to. So I will. Um, I see Karina, Christina, and Angie all said that they'd like some help with that. So how about at uh, two o'clock? Two o'clock, we can hop on um, Zoom and let, we can do the same Zoom that we do for my classroom. So the leadership Zoom and the. Um, leadership zoom and my class zoom you guys know what zoom i'm talking about right yeah i'll post it um i will be on here at two o'clock today giving you guys a chance for a break i'll be on two to three um anyone who wants uh help brainstorming or getting ready pop on and i'll be there for you okay Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Uh, bye.